Ryan Reynolds here from Mint Mobile. With the price of just about everything going up during inflation, we thought we'd bring our prices down. So to help us, we brought in a reverse auctioneer, which is apparently a thing. Mint Mobile Unlimited Premium Wireless. Ready to get 30, 30, ready to get 30, ready to get 20, 20, 20, ready to get 20, 20, ready to get 15, 15, 15, 15, just 15 bucks a month. So give it a try at mintmobile.com slash switch. $45 up front for three months plus taxes and fees. Promote for new customers for limited time. Unlimited more than 40 gigabytes per month. Slows. Full terms at mintmobile.com. The Agile Brand. Welcome to Season 6 of The Agile Brand, where we discuss marketing technology and customer experience trends, insights, and ideas with enterprise and technology platform leaders. We focus on the people, processes, data, and platforms that make brands successful, scalable, customer-focused, and sustainable. This is what makes an Agile brand. I'm your host, Greg Kilstrom, advising Fortune 1000 brands on MarTech, marketing operations, and CX, best-selling author and speaker. The Agile Brand Podcast is brought to you by Tech Systems, an industry leader in full-stack technology services, talent services, and real-world application. For more information, go to teksystems.com. Before we get started, I wanted to let you know that my latest book, Priority is Action, Seven Principles for Better Strategies, Decisions, and Outcomes, is now available. In it, I give ideas and insights for leaders and teams that need to make meaningful progress on their priorities. After all, our priorities are what we do, not what we say we'd like to do. You can find Priority as Action on Amazon or learn more on my website, gregkilstrom.com. Now let's get on to the show. So we are here at Pega World Inspire 2024 at the MGM Grand in Las Vegas and seeing some amazing things, including how AI can transform the enterprise. And I've gotten a chance to be hands-on at the Innovation Hub, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, some of that stuff in a minute as well. As the marketing world braces for the impact of sunsetting third-party cookies, innovative strategies are stepping up to redefine how businesses engage with customers. Joining us today to talk about this as well as the impact of generative AI on enterprise marketing is Tara DeZeo, Product Marketing Director, AdTech and MarTech at Pega to explore these developments. Tara, welcome back to the show. Oh, thank you for having me, Greg. It's great to be here. Yeah, looking forward to talking with you again. Um, so let's get started. Uh, those that didn't catch you last time you were on the show, why don't you give a little background on yourself as well as your role at Pega? Absolutely. So I am the product marketing director at Pega for Customer Decision Hub, and I'm a subject matter expert in ad tech and martech. I've had a, a long career in ad tech in both startups and Fortune 500 companies, and at Pega, you know, we're trying to really help clients create amazing customer experiences, and I love talking about that with people like you. Nice, nice. Well, yeah, <laughs> let's let's dive in then. So let's start by talking about first-party data, and certainly I think it's something on everyone's mind. So cookie deprecation, it's, is it really happening? Like we've been talking about this for, I don't know, two, three, yeah. because like two decades, but probably two or three years, right? Totally. So, you know, with this happening at some point, maybe we'll hear that there's another delay still, but like with this happening and, you know, it's kind of the impending sunsetting of this, how can enterprises that are maybe a little behind the curve, uh, you know, still pivot to maximize first party data so they can have better customer experiences? Yeah, you know, the key in maximizing your data is being able to activate it in the places that matter for your brand, right? And a couple of the things that I tell people about data is that the closer to real time you can get, the better, right? Because, you know, when I first started in ad tech, talking about third party cookies, a fresh cookie would be less than 30 days old. Wow, yeah, yeah. Um, I remember that, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and now it's like old within an hour. So make sure that your data is as fresh as possible, as clean as possible. And then I've been hearing a lot of different um, practitioners talking about ways to augment your first party data by getting the consumer to give you more information. So creating experiences that actually allow them to want to interact with you about behavioral data, for example. Um, I always use the example of Brooks, who's not a client of ours. They make running shoes. Yeah. Um, and when you go to their website, even if you're not a customer of theirs, they ask you, you know, three or four questions about the way that you run and what sport that you do and you know, why you're there. Yeah. Um, and even if you don't end up converting, 
They just got some behavioral data from you through your own volition. So I think that's a way that we're going to see um, different enterprises and organizations try to build out a little bit more data collection that isn't so specifically just about purchases and things like that. Yeah, and that, I mean, the example you gave, that's a natural type of question to ask versus, you know, if a shoe company asks you what kind of refrigerator you have, yeah. <laughs> that feels a little like, what are you doing with my data, right? So like, I, you know, I, I keep saying on this show, like I think consumers are smart already, but they're getting smarter. And, I, you know, do, would you say, asking the right questions, even maybe one or two more questions than you might normally ask, as long as there's a kind of a clear rationale behind it? Is yes. I, you know, I think we've, one of the things that we do at CDH it really well is contextual data, right? And, and marketers have been trying to utilize context for a long time. But this is a way to get contextual data that's accurate. So when we think about some of the other ways that consumers give up their data that aren't necessarily like, I'm part of your bank, you have all my information, think about survey data. It's really inaccurate because people are just trying to get to the end for whatever incentive. So they lie, they, they, they you know, click the wrong button, they don't care about the results. When you're buying a running shoe, you really want it to fit. Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're spending a lot of money, you wanna make sure that you're getting the right Right. Um, tool f for yourself. And so it, it's an incentive for the consumer to give you that, yeah. that they really want a good outcome. Yeah, and so you mentioned CDH, and just for those that are a little less familiar with Pega and, and the platform, why don't you just explain a little bit what you're talking about oh, there? Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. Pega Customer Decision Hub is an AI powered real time decisioning platform. So what we do is we help brands interact with their customers and prospects in real time across all of their brand channels. Uh, we have adaptive AI models. So if you come in, um, you know, customer journeys, they used to be linear because we were programming them. Now a customer journey is more like an octopus tentacle. And, you know, if you're watching TV, let's say, but you're also trying to research, you know, living situations for your parents, let's just say. Yeah. You're kind of doing two things at once where you're emitting signals in two places, right? Over your connected TV, perhaps, maybe on your phone. And then you might have someone on the couch sitting next to you on their iPad. So when that data input changes, when you have an adaptive modeling, you, you, the brand is able to pivot to that next thing very quickly. So if you decide, okay, I don't want to um, move money from one account to the other. I'm actually going to go over here and do the X, Y, and Z thing, it's important to not continue with the interaction that you've terminated. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's, I mean, a couple things there. I mean, so that's where like next best action really comes into play, right? So, and that's where, that's why we don't want 30 day old cookies. Yes. <laughs> and it's why we want to maybe even ask a little bit more information, but, you know, what, what have you seen as far as getting that, that additional information for those that may not immediately want to, you know, want to volunteer it or whatever? Like, have you seen any examples of incentives or like, how, how, does, a, how does a brand kind of get that extra? Like the, the shoe example was great, yeah. but are there, are there other ways to maybe the, the more reluctant customers? Yeah, you know, I think if you can sort of just demonstrate what the benefit would be, yeah. be transparent about the value exchange. I was just talking um, about consent management, and we're in this sort of phase in life where every website we go to has a pop-up, you click it, you don't know what you're clicking, you just do it because you want to see the content. I think if, if there's a, a path to having a more informed consent, that could be helpful, right? Because if you can say, hey, I, I want this from you and I'm going to give you this, that's a value exchange. And we've been hearing about the value exchange for a long time, but I don't think that we're very good at that. You know, so, and con content is, content creation is really the way to engage customers and, and get them to give you data, right? So if you're creating amazing, helpful content you're gonna be better at that. I was just at the Gartner conference and there was a session on personalization there talking about 
you know, the ever uh, <laughs> existing tension between too much personalization and not enough personalization. And really what the consumer wants is for you to be respectful and helpful. Mm. They want helpful personalization. Yeah. So yeah. are you saying happy birthday to me? Don't care. <laughs> right. Are you helping me save money on my ATM fees? Really care. I'm excited to announce an exclusive offer that will enhance your listening experience of the Agile Brand with Greg Kilstrom podcast. You can now listen to my show, The Agile Brand, completely ad-free on your favorite listening apps like Spotify and Apple for just $4.99 a month, giving you access to all the great conversations with top thought leaders in marketing technology, CX, and more without the ads. To learn more and sign up, follow the link in the show notes to listen to The Agile Brand completely ad-free. Check it out now. One of the things, we're going to talk about generative AI in a few different ways, but one of the things that I'm most excited about with that is, again, we've been talking about personalization for years, and it's getting better, and you know, depending on what you use, how you use it, how you approach it, it can be done pretty well already, but I'm really excited about generative AI to take personalization truly one-to-one, -one, keeping in mind the things that you're saying, yes. but you know, where... Are we are we quite there yet? Are we there close to get that that true like content generation one to one? Like where do you think we are? Um, I think we're in a place where you know I'm seeing Gen AI make personalization better, and that it's yeah. inspiring create more creativity. Yeah. I think as it relates to you know AI generated content and personalization. I think we still need that human element involved just because, for example, as it relates to CDH, when you're a client of ours, you build out a library of conversations for your next best action. Yeah. So that library is only going to be as good as the, the number of offers that you put in it yeah. and the, the volume, right? So if a brand is able to understand their customer and create really valuable content and a, a ton of offers, that's going to be, you know, a, a really, they're going to have better outcomes. Yeah, yeah. As it relates to Gen AI, I think what that is going to do is it's going to reduce the time to market that you get creatives created. It's going to help with, I have, uh, we have a, a great customer that's a, a large healthcare provider in Australia, and they actually use the Gen AI within CDH to do pre-concepting mm, yeah. so that when they hand over their brief to their agency, they're further along down the path and they only have to go four rounds instead of 10. Yeah. And that saves money, it saves cycles and burnout, it saves energy and yeah. carbon footprint. So yeah. I think you know if you can make the creative process better, you, personalization will get better along with it. Yeah, and that's that's another interesting part to me is not just, you know, I think there's a lot of talk about generative AI in terms of creating, you know, text images, video now, all, the, yeah. all this stuff. But the process improvements, certainly that's something Pega is very yeah. <laughs> familiar with, you know, for, for many years. But mixing generative AI with process improvements, I think, is really interesting and not necessarily something that marketers would have gravitated to first, you know, but, but, you know, what are your thoughts there as far as, I mean, you mentioned kind of an example yeah. there, but where do we take that? Like, how can we take it further? Yeah. You know, I mean, I think at first people were afraid that Gen AI was going to take their jobs and right? now <laughs> right. we we're understanding that that's not really the case. I think, you know, it makes, it makes our, even our individual processes better. I think, you know, as marketers, we're always under-resourced. We're asked to do so much. And for an industry that's supposed to be very creative, it's, there's a lot of processes that just really burn you out. So as an individual contributor even, just being able to like brainstorm my outline for something is a huge energy brain save. It's a way to sort of even come to a brainstorming meeting more prepared, you know, like, it, there's nothing worse than showing up for a three-hour brainstorming meeting and nobody has ideas because everybody's just totally burned out and blank. Right. They're they're worried about the minutia of like the stuff that must get done, but yes. it doesn't really take the 
it doesn't require human brain power. It just is taking it regardless, right? Absolutely. So, yeah, yeah. You know, the other thing, I mean, I've, I've used a lot of different AI tools myself, and you know, I, I write a lot of stuff and, and everything. What I've noticed is I, I'm a really iterative person, and so sometimes you could say I wing it sometimes. Sure. Um, actually using prompts and doing these things has actually kind of brought me back to actually being a little more strategic and thinking a few steps ahead, because you're, you're essentially explaining what you want to do to a child, you know, yeah. for lack of nothing against, you know, yeah, but like yeah. <laughs> some someone or something that knows nothing about anything unless uh, without context, right? Yeah, so it's for like sure. it's actually kind of forced me to, yeah, to again to think four steps ahead and and then benefit from the you know from kind of the 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 grunt work, so to say, to, that it's able to do. But I don't know what what impacts do you see it having on on marketing teams? Yeah, I think we're going to see just the ability to scale content variation is a major, you know, tactical process that that's going to be an area that's it's going to help a lot and I think as it relates to again personalization and things like, you know, if you're a global marketing organization, you have to make this in English, French, Japanese, however many languages and you also have to be culturally sensitive in those situations. And so creating an ad set takes a lot longer, but if you can do it based on stuff you've already done with Gen AI, that's gonna be, you're gonna be able to scale that uh, process way faster and better. Yeah, yeah. And so another thing to kind of add on to, you know, so building on process and, and AI, so, Good marketers pay attention to analytics. They're, you know, they're statistic driven. Some, well, a marketer that says they don't like math is a little suspect to me. Sure. But um, I'm not, I don't consider myself a, you know, I'm not a PhD mathematician, but you kind of have to know this stuff. But I think there's a difference between being really good at reading the numbers and being data driven. Sure. You know? So being able to interpret is one thing, but then that feedback loop, I think, is what's, you know, what's often missing from a lot of teams is really taking taking the data, understanding it, and then having it actually drive the decisions. And certainly, you know, at Pega World, we've been hearing a lot about data-driven decision making yeah. in the enterprise. Um, just curious your thoughts on, you know, are do you think marketers are moving more towards being data-driven and decision making? Is there still some, you know, room to move there? Yeah, you know, I think, the innovate, one of the innovations that AI has brought to us is the ability to understand if our programs are working more quickly yeah. and be able to pull insights from channels more effectively. So if you think about the old days, you might run a campaign, whoever ran it for you, or maybe you ran it internally, you get the results after. Then you can go back and say, okay, this message didn't work over here, this message worked better over here. I think what we're seeing now is the ability to a one, be able to simulate things and test them before you put them into production, which is huge. And then also in the middle of a campaign, if something's not resonated, it's, it's not resonating, you can pull it down. You know, if there's an error, you can pull it down. There's no reason to stop something that's not working. There's no reason to let something continue just because you've put it in motion. And I think the, the smart marketers understand that. Yeah, yeah, and I know um, it's not a new feature in the Pega platform, but the simulation thing that you mentioned is very cool. It and is, yeah. the first time I saw it, it was a little while ago, but like the first time I saw it, it you know, just kind of blows your mind to think that, again, we, we get the smartest people we can in a room and we like strategize yeah. and, and, you know, we look at the analytics and, and all that kind of stuff, but this is very different than that. Can you talk a little bit about it? Yeah, so I mean, just at the most basic granular level, if you think about a brand having to calculate how much a customer relationship is worth to them, that's kind of like a hand tabulation, right? You're, you're X, Y, Z, multiply that by whatever. With Customer Decision Hub, you can actually figure out what value that interaction is going to give you for that specific customer with the algorithm. So then you're in a position where you can say, okay, I figured out that these... 50 customers should not be given this offer because it's not going to be profitable based on the product that I'm, you know, that they're eligible for 
or you know, in some respects that we want to sell to them. So being able to see the value so instantly on that granular level, I think is a, a marketing planner's dream right. scenario. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, like I said, it's pretty pretty interesting, and I mean it. It it does so much of the legwork for you and and guesswork, you know, takes some of that stuff out of the way. Um, another thing that you know was announced here at, at Pega World is Gen AI Blueprint, and I know that, you know it's not necessarily specific to marketing, yeah. but very cool, you know, feature and and probably has some implications later on for for other things like what we've been talking about. Do you mind just talking a little bit about it? Yeah. So as it relates to CDH, we are actually working on a CDH. Blueprint nice. and, okay. and the functionality there is going to be to map out your customer journeys. Um, so I think that journey orchestration is still something that we see marketers struggling with. Yeah. And we yeah. believe that you know, the customer is really in control of the journey. Like We shouldn't be pushing them in a direction or another. Um, but this is going to be a way to see how you're mapping it out before it goes live. And if that's a, you know, a rational uh, path for you and you know not every brand is going to be in the position to have adaptive analytics so uh, for the folks that are still programming out their customer journeys that's going to be um, a blueprint to have that in front of you yeah. is great yeah yeah well and I think the some of the struggles that at least that I've seen organizations run into is with journey orchestration not only the customer you know when as you're saying when you Try to map out and guess what the customer needs, and tell you know, you're essentially telling the customer what they need yes. instead of <laughs> listening to the customer. So it's yes. it's counterintuitive to the whole idea of customer experience when you when you think of it that way. But I think another hurdle that a lot of orgs run into is the journey of the customer is one thing, but all of the supporting roles and processes that lie under you know behind the scenes, yes. so to speak. There's a lot that needs to change and, and stuff. So, I mean, is that is that kind of part of the process too? Yeah, I mean, so not every organization has all of their channels connected, right? So it's a way too to identify gaps. Like, okay, this is gonna run, but this other channel is disconnected, so we need to account for that in some other way. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Well, um, as we kind of wrap up here, as as we're kind of talking about, I guess we talked about a few things here yeah, today. Yeah. So, you know, where where it is where is Pega kind of positioning itself as this? You know, you could say it's a convergence of you know, there's Gen AI, there's different types of AI, first party data. You know, where what should we be looking for? You know, in the months ahead. Yeah, you know, I think um, we're getting to the place where we're going to be up an end-to-end -end solution with some of the partnerships and things that we're creating, and more to come on that. But I think the thing that I have seen in my career is that there's just really no one-size-fits-all solution. And I think that the way that Pega can work with brands and work with data connectors and partners, we're gonna be as close to that as you can possibly get. Yeah, yeah, love it. Well, very last question. Um, what's the highlight for you uh, this year at Pega World? Oh my gosh, the highlight is seeing people that I don't get to see throughout the year that I work with. Partners, to journalists, to colleagues, and just realizing how lucky that I am to be surrounded by brilliant, creative, just lovely folks. Wonderful. Yeah. That's I great to hear. Yeah. Yeah. I love my job and it just reminds <laughs> me that. You know, some, we all get bogged down with the day-to-day -day grind, but then when you have an event like this, it really just fills you with energy. Yeah, totally agree. Love it. Well, again, I'd like to thank Tara DeZeo, Product Marketing Director, Ad Tech and MarTech at Pega, for joining us today. Uh, for more information on Pega and Tara's work, uh, please take a look at the show notes. Thanks again for listening to The Agile Brand, brought to you by Tech Systems. If you enjoyed the show, please take a minute to subscribe and leave us a rating so that others can find the show more easily. You can access more episodes of the show at www.gregkilstrom.com. That's G-R-E-G-K-I-H-L-S-T-R-O-M dot com. While you're there, check out my series of best-selling Agile brand guides covering a wide variety of marketing technology topics, or you can search for Greg Kilstrom on Amazon. The Agile brand is produced by Missing Link, a Latina-owned, strategy-driven, creatively-fueled production co-op. From ideation to creation, they craft human connections through intelligent, engaging, and informative content. 
Until next time, stay agile. The Agile Brand. If you're tired of hearing the same old judgmental, shaming financial advice about buying too many lattes from old white men who conveniently ignore issues like systemic oppression, it's time to join the Financial Feminist Podcast. Hosted by Tori Dunlap, a globally recognized money educator, Financial Feminist is the number one money podcast for women. It goes beyond just talking about money. It explores how money uniquely affects women. Featuring fascinating guests like Ramit Sadie, Amy Porterfield, Maya Vander, Hannah Berner, Justin Baldoni, Eve Rodsky, and experts across finance and feminism, the podcast dives into topics such as the investing gap, sex work, diet culture, MLMs, the prison industrial complex, the psychology of money, and much more. Additionally, listeners can benefit from how-to episodes like how to start investing or how to finally become debt-free. Join in smashing the patriarchy and getting rich one episode at a time. Subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. This episode is brought to you by the Yap Media Podcast Network. I'm Hala Taha, CEO of the award-winning digital media empire, Yap Media, and host of Yap Young and Profiting Podcast, a number one entrepreneurship and self-improvement podcast where you can listen, learn, and profit. On Young and Profiting Podcast, I interview the brightest minds in the world, and I turn their wisdom into actionable advice that you can use in your daily life. Each week, we dive into a new topic like the art of side hustles, how to level up your influence and persuasion, and goal setting. I interview A-list guests on Young and Profiting. I've got the best guests, like the world's number one negotiation expert, Chris Voss, Shark, Damon John, serial entrepreneurs, Alex and Layla Hermosi, and even movie stars like Matthew McConaughey. There's absolutely no fluff on my podcast, and that's on purpose. Every episode is jam-packed with advice that's gonna push your life forward. I do my research, I get straight to the point, and I take things really seriously which is why I'm known as the podcast princess and how I became one of the top podcasters in the world in less than five years. Young and Profiting Podcast is for all ages. Don't let the name fool you. It's an advanced show. As long as you want to learn and level up, you will be forever young. So join podcast royalty and subscribe to Young and Profiting Podcast or Yap, like it's often called by my Yap fam on Apple, Spotify, CastBox, or wherever you listen to your podcasts.